Very nice to be here on, on such a beautiful day, although I gather the weather in Edinburgh is even nicer today. But <laughs> 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 no, seriously. <laughs> um, now, if that isn't a, a rare coincidence, then um, what better illustration could you wish than, than for the, the topic of this, this meeting? So I'm here to give a little introduction to some of the issues about fine-tuning in, in the study of modern cosmology. So this is what I want to try and get through. Um, I'd better start off by saying a few words about what fine-tuning actually means when you're entitled to say something is and is not fine-tuned. Um, then from that definition, I'll go on to reviewing some of the problems that we have in cosmology, making sense of some of the numbers that characterise the universe. Um, lead amongst those is, of course, the, the, the topic of the dark energy or the energy density of the vacuum. So I'll spend a little bit of, of time talking about what we know about that and how we know it and then move on to one possible approach, the most controversial, perhaps the most widely discussed at the moment, that is solving this by means of the multiverse, or if you want to be less controversial, an, an ensemble approach. Are we just one of many universes? In some ways, that's the biggest question in modern cosmology, I think. So naturalness. Uh, this is a term that's, that we steal, as with many things, from, from particle physics. And what it really stems from is the idea that if you have a theory of parameters in, they should all be one or thereabouts, unless you have a, um, a very good reason why not. That is, um, if you're assuming that everything is, is written in terms of dimensionless parameters, if you want to work in terms of things that have a dimension, a, a, an actual scale, then, for example, this says in, in particle physics, there's a, a fundamental energy or mass scale, which is the Planck scale. And therefore, basically, all particles um, that participate in gravitational interaction should have a mass which is of order of the Planck mass. And so it's a puzzle in particle physics that that naturalness um, requirement is, is broken. The way it tends to be broken is um, to, to have some symmetry that naturally imposes that the, the value of the parameter will be zero. And then the breaking of the symmetry can, can bring in a small parameter naturally. Another way of looking at this is to say, in, in terms of naturalness, you should distinguish between the bare value of a parameter and the way it becomes changed by a more sophisticated calculation, that is, quantum corrections. So um, let's take as an example um, <coughs> the, the changes to the, the, the mass of the electron, the electron self-energy. So this is something you can compute in, in, in relativistic and non-relativistic perturbation theory. And the answers in both cases are the same, they're, they're infinite. So as, as is common, you have to cut things off, that is, include some maximum energy scale or minimum length scale that's allowed for, for virtual quanta. The interesting thing, though, is if you do this non-relativistically, you get something like this, that is, the, the fractional change to the electron's mass from quantum corrections goes linearly with your energy cutoff. So it's of order the cutoff mass divided by the electron mass. Whenever we talk about cutoffs, as we will later on in the context of, of vacuum energy, one has in mind new physics. So formally speaking, lambda should be zero, but you presume that flat space quantum field theory breaks down at some scale. So here you have an unnatural situation because the, if this, this ratio must be large, lambda could well be of order the Planck mass. So the correction to the electron mass is completely dominant over its bare value. But if you do this properly with, uh, with a relativistic approach, this linear correction becomes logarithmic. And now you don't really care whether this ratio is, is unity or 10 to the very large number. It's still a small correction, alpha being the fine structure constant. So sometimes um, you can have results that are generally natural in this sense. But there's many cases when it's not the case, and the mass of the Higgs is, is one interesting case where nobody in particle physics, I believe, understands why the Higgs is as light as it is. Um, the hope was that an additional symmetry, that is supersymmetry, would come in and save the day. So far there's been no sign of that. So particle physics certainly has problems under these headings. 
What, what does cosmology have? I think um, <coughs> I'm going to distinguish three topics here, which uh, could be cast as, um, as, as dimensionless parameters having strange values. Although the first one is actually the opposite of, of what I just said. In, uh, in particle physics, one struggles to understand where a small number comes from. Here, we're interested in numbers of order unity. So, for example, we know in the universe that the density of baryonic material is about the same as the dark matter density to a power of 10. We also know that the time in the universe at which its global equation of state changed from radiation dominated to matter dominated <coughs> was about the same time as causal contact was lost between matter and radiation. That is, the, um, the photons of the microwave background were last scattered. These two densities, these two eras are in principle completely independent of each other, and yet they end up being the same. One, I think, would like to understand those coincidences. So those are coincidences of value. You could also talk about coincidences of time. Um, we live in a universe in which, as far as we can tell, there's a non-zero vacuum density. That is, the expansion of the universe is accelerating, and that's inferred to be driven by something that empirically seems to be indistinguishable from a cosmological constant, a simple energy density of the vacuum. Again, today, that energy density has a density about the same as that of ordinary matter. But that's something that very much changes with time. It can only be true at a special time. We happen to live at that time. Um, I'll mention a similar sort of um, coincidence that we live at a time just when nonlinear gravitational clustering is about to erase forever all the um, information about primordial fluctuations that allow us to do cosmology. These two may be connected, as we'll see. Um, and certainly, this leads on to this, this general issue that occupies very much of our time, of trying to understand what the energy density of the vacuum is and whether it's some more general constituent called generically dark energy, even though, as we all know, that's a dreadful name, too easily confused with, with dark matter. So let's start by uh, a few words on some of these coincidences. That here's, so to astronomical accuracy, the density of baryons, the density of dark matter are identical. But the physics that sets these, well, is in both cases not understood, but there's, there's a simplest standard explanation. Um, but they're very different. So most people, if they had to guess, would guess that the baryon content of the universe is set by something to do with CP violation. And that's because the universe is, is heavily asymmetric between particles and antiparticles when it comes to baryons. So the, the, the um, antiproton density is, is as good as nothing, apart from ones that are generated by, by new nuclear reactions. So you, you tend to feel, since we observe CP violation, that is particle-antiparticle asymmetry in other sectors of, of particle physics, that the ratio between baryons and photons, about 10 to the minus 9, represents some such small asymmetry as one finds buried in the standard model. On the other hand, the simplest hypothesis for the, the dark matter density is freeze out of particles and antiparticles. That is, at early times, there was a, a, a relic, uh, there was a background of roughly equal numbers of photons, mass, some exotic massive particle and its antipartner. As the universe cooled, those was annihilated, but the annihilation didn't quite go to completion, and there's some small residue is left when the annihilation time scale becomes too long. And you can predict what that is if you simply know the, um, something to do with the, uh, the cross-section of the process and the mass of the particle. So very simple fundamental physics goes into these two things, but completely different. So how you could tie up CP violation with, with these properties that are to do with a simple particle annihilation is not clear. So either you need some additional selection mechanism that has enforced these things to come together, or you have to accept that there's different physics involved. But there's a puzzle either way. Um, let's talk about the coincidence in time between the eras of, um, of matter radiation equality which is about 3,000 and a bit, but it depends on the density of the universe. Obviously, for a, a low-density universe, in principle, it might 
the, the universe might be radiation dominated to this day. Um, whereas more or less independent of the cosmological parameters, the microwave background was generated at a rate shift a little over a thousand. That's a very robust number. So why are these the same? Well, recombination happens roughly when the temperature is about the ionization potential of, 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 of hydrogen. And, um, <coughs> and the matter radiation equality happens when um, the typical thermal energy times the, the photon number density is about the matter density. Put these together, then you can predict the, um, the baryon to, um, to photon ratio in terms of electron proton mass and the fine structure constant. And you get about the, the observed 10 to the minus 9. But this isn't an explanation. It's just showing that these two coincidences that we don't understand are actually tied together. So if you'd explain one, only one, you might explain the other. However, an explanation is still required. So let's think about this from a statistical point of view. Um, that is, how, how would a Bayesian approach this? Because you might say that there's no point asking whether this is puzzling or not. Um, the universe is out there. It knows what its density is. Uh, it knows what the, the, the photon to baryon ratio is. These are just numbers. They're fixed. So, and yet we persist in talking about whether a, a given universe is probable or improbable. And this is okay in, in the Bayesian point of view because probability actually means putting a, a quantification on your state of knowledge about the universe. So you're allowed to talk about the probability that the, the universe has some, some parameter, even though it has that number. Um, but I've always had a slight difficulty with, with this, even though I know mathematically it's, it's fine and um, philosophically it's fine. It's an awful lot easier to talk about probabilities. And uh, if any of you ever have, have to lecture on this to undergraduates, uh, you start off with um, tossing coins and so on. You have a, an ensemble of repeated trials where you really can talk about probability as, as, um, as, as frequency. So it's always interesting, I think, at the back of your mind to have the possibility that there really is an ensemble behind all of this. So when we talk about the probability that the vacuum density might take a certain value, you have in, in mind a distinct number of universes where, where that value generally does differ. And as we'll see, that physically is something that, that can make sense. Um, so the, the problem in making the Bayesian worldview work in any of this, uh, and, and indeed almost all of science, Bayesian statistics can be quite controversial because people will say correctly that often you don't know what the prior is. I mean, the prior is something that should be derived from, from a meta theory, a, a, a larger theory of the, um, the, the variable quantity that you're, you're dealing with. But often we don't know enough to calculate that. And an, an excellent example will be um, concerning with the, the, the cosmological constant. So presumably, if you had a complete theory of the early universe and how we got to where we are, and you were thinking either in, in a Bayesian way or explicitly in terms of, of concrete instantiations of a multiverse, you could compute the probability distribution for lambda to take a given value. We can't do that yet. Goodness knows when we can. But empirically, as we'll see, um, we know that lambda is small, not quite zero, but very close to zero. So um, in, this, um, in this case, you can argue that the, that prior distribution should, can be treatable by just um, approximating it as a constant value over some small range. But that depends on assuming that the, the point of interest parameter value zero, in that case, is not special. And there are plenty of counterexamples to that. So, um, for example, if you're interested in studying the curvature of the universe around its vacuum energy, you'd have to take a completely different approach because we know that there are ways of generating curved universes by bubble nucleation that produce only negative curvature. So zero curvature is very much a special case. Now, the trouble is that statistics is all well and good, but sometimes it can lead you off in a wild goose chase because we live in a world where coincidences do happen. Um, 
And I'll give you an example which may well bear on some of the, the things that, that we, we tend to talk about. So let's imagine the simplest case. I have two independent parameters, which I'll normalise so that they, um, they, sc they scan from 0 to 1. And, um, and so that the distribution is just scattered uniformly over some, um, some square. And you pick a point at random out of that square. Well, in 5% of the experiments, the difference between the x and the y value you pick will be within 2% of each other. And if you cast that in terms of the, the, the um, kind of order of magnitude constants we talk about, particularly using a Jaynes prior where each power of 10 is, um, is, is equally occupied, what that says is that if you have um, a total range in the x and the y parameters of 40 powers of 10, then it's not unreasonable to suppose that you could get, purely by chance, um, the two numbers equal to one power of ten. So that actually there may be nothing more to the baryon dark matter coincidence than this. That the, the ratio might easily have been five powers of ten different, ten powers of ten different. We ended up with one power of ten. There's nothing to explain. And we could spend you know, the billions of, uh, of, of euros of public money carrying out research to try and explain it. It would all be pointless. But there are some challenges to, to naturalness, to fine-tuning cosmology, that I think are, are beyond that sort of explanation. And the vacuum is one. By the way, did you know this is why the um, US um, Department of Energy funds, um, funds research into, into dark energy? <laughs> I actually think it has military applications. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the only kind of energy that, that so far... Uh, hasn't been used in this way, so I suppose it's only a matter of time, isn't it? <laughs> what is the dark energy? What is the thing that's causing the, um, the acceleration of the universe? How do we understand it? Well, there are three possible approaches to this. Um, the first is the easiest, and, and I have to hold up my hand and, and confess that I used to be in this camp. As, as I'll show, the, um, the idea that the the vacuum density could be non-zero at a small level is so manifestly stupid that you should have a very strong prior against that possibility. So it took me many years of, of new experiments before I became convinced. But the data look very much like um, Einstein's cosmological constant, which of course he wrote down on the left-hand side of his field equations as a modification of the curvature of space-time, and we simply put this term on the right-hand side now and treat it as an energy density. And it's actually r remarkable to, I don't know how many of you have read Einstein's 1917 paper on this. It, it really is beautiful because this is a, an argument that is, is actually something that, Ein that Newton could have done. And it's really just, just a question of trying to solve Poisson's equation in a uniform universe where the matter density is uniform and the gravitational potential is uniform. Realizing that this doesn't work unless you change the equation. So in, in another member of the multiverse, Newton invented the cosmological constant. What a, what a shame he missed it. Um, so if you think that this extra energy density of the vacuum is there, what could it be physically? Well, at one level, here it is. It's a number in Einstein's equations, and this is what one would call the bare cosmological constant. But you can think of physical contributions to the energy momentum tensor that would look indistinguishable. The first one was suggested actually... Um, by the thermodynamics pioneer Nernst in, in 1916, um, that from a quantum mechanical point of view, the, the, the vacuum should have a non-zero energy density. Um, subsequently, we've invented this thing, dark energy, that's more general. It could encompass the, um, the constant vacuum density, but it could also talk about some dynamics. And basically, this dynamics comes, it's inspired really by, by the Higgs model. That is saying, we know that there is, in, in the universe, in this room right now, a single scalar field um, which can change with time, and it's the change of that field that's, that amounts to the detection of the Higgs boson. So maybe there are other similar sort of fields. But let's start with the, um, the simplest physical contribution, that is um, the one that Nernst thought about. His argument was simply to say, what is the vacuum? The vacuum 
is one where you take each wave mode of the electromagnetic field, you set it to its lowest possible energy. But that's not zero. Each wave mode treated as an oscillator has to have a half h cross omega of zero point energy. So you simply add up the zero point energy um, uh, up to some maximum uh, mode energy and you get a, a total that scales as the fourth power of the, of the energy density. And this is a, a calculation that you'll find in, in very, very many books. Um, unfortunately, it's completely wrong, but let's pursue it. What people tend to argue is that the, um, the maximum energy that you should assign should be the energy scale of new physics, presumably gravitational again, the Planck energy. And if you contrast that energy with the effective energy you need to put in here, which is order a milli electron volt to account for the observed value of lambda, then you have a discrepancy in energy density of, of 120 powers of 10. And I'm sure you've all heard this number. But the trouble is, this calculation isn't a candidate for the energy density of the vacuum because it's really just the same one that you do to compute the um, energy density of black body radiation. You just change the occupation number of the wave modes. And so you know that you're going to get the same equation of state as, 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 as um, of radiation. That is, the pressure should be one-third the vacuum density. So in terms of the parameter that everybody uses, the ratio between these two, W should be one-third. For the vacuum, it should be minus one. So this is a complete fail, and we should never, ever have used this calculation or talked about this number. And um, unfortunately, I'm ashamed to say it's only about three years ago, to, I myself realized this elementary point. Um, a better way of doing it is to have, the, the, the reason there's a problem is that this simple cutoff of the maximum energy isn't relativistically invariant. And you may be sure that if the vacuum has some energy density, that has to be invariant under Lorentz transforms. So if you try and do it in a relativistic way, you get an interestingly different formula. Um, Dimensionally, the energy density still has to go as a, a mass to the fourth, but it's not your cutoff mass. It's the mass associated with the quantum of the field you're, you're dealing with, with some logarithmic correction. So if we only had electromagnetism to deal with, there wouldn't be a lambda problem, because the energy density of the vacuum contributed by electromagnetic fields should be zero, because the mass of the photon is zero. And in practice, it makes rather little difference, actually, because What's the largest value of the mass of a particle that we know about? It's the top quark, a couple of hundred GeV. Um, new physics could come in at a scale not very much beyond that because the LHC hasn't pushed many orders of magnitude and energy beyond that. So at the moment, we know that either way, the energy density of the vacuum should be associated with the fourth power of, of an energy of about one TeV. And at the moment, it's MeV. So we have a discrepancy in energy of about 15 powers of 10, um, which is not such a big coincidence. So you might now start to wonder whether there's a problem at all. But I, I think there is. Um, because, and it's an, another one of these, these cancellation problems. And this goes back to Zaldovich, Zaldovich and Sakharov realized that the effective cosmological constant would add in the bare one plus this physical vacuum density. And so now you do have to think about um, taking the fourth power. So now you've got um, at least 60 powers of 10 cancellation. And I think that's, that's too much to attribute to, to um, pure coincidence. So we need to understand somehow how this, this total can be so small. And one well-pursued approach is to, is to say that maybe it's small, because in the past, it used to have the large value that you would think is natural, um, but it ha has dynamics, so it's falling towards zero, and it hasn't quite got there yet, and it's just passing through zero at the moment. Um, the way this is realized, as I said, is in terms of scalar fields, the same mechanism, in, in effect, that's used by Higgs. It was given the, the rather cheesy name quintessence in, in the cosmology literature. Um, but all it means is you have a scalar field sitting in some potential rolling towards the bottom. And the equations of motion of this are very s simple and you'll, you will get a vacuum-like equation of state basically if the field is, is rolling very small, very slowly. So the, a kinetic term from phi dot is small compared to the, the value of the potential, the energy density 
as a function of, of the field itself. But this is a problem because we want to produce something which is in this, this um, potential dominated regime now and it might have got stuck there at almost any value. Um, so what, what managed to put it at the right height to match the, the cosmological constant we have today? Well, a way this could have been done, um, which turns out not to work, is, is tracking. So a much more plausible a, a approach would be to, to imagine that actually the, um, the, the effective cosmological constant followed the energy density of, of all the other matter in the universe, but just recently changed its alteration with time to become dominant. In principle, this could happen because we very recently went through, in cosmological terms, the phase transition between matter domination and radiation domination. And we know that we're not going to live in the universe while it's radiation dominated. So if, if lambda could switch on at a time when the universe was only after radiation domination ceased, then maybe this would work. But it turns out that once you set tracking up, it's actually rather hard to get out of it. So the universe would, the dark energy would track the radiation in the radiation era, and it would track the matter in the matter era and just keep on falling. So without cheating and putting in an energy scale by hand, tracking turns out not to work. So it's difficult dynamically to make a, something that looks like a cosmological constant. We can ask whether, um, empirically anyway, we need to do that. Um, just let me say briefly how this is done. Um, the expansion rate of the universe, dictated by the, the Hubble parameter, uh, changes with time according to the, the energy content. So the changing matter density, the changing radiation density, and if we alter the equation of state of the vacuum from W equals minus 1, then the vacuum density changes a little bit. So in principle, if you can measure the expansion rate with time, which you can get from, from measuring the distance with time, um, then you can get some inferences on, on W. It's extremely hard, actually. Um, it turns out that the thing you can measure, say the distance, is not perfectly insensitive to W, but very, very weakly sensitive. So by about a multiplier of 5. That is, if you want to measure W even to 5%, which is more or less the precision of current experiments, you need to measure the distance to 1%. So 1% distances in cosmology is, is some achievement. So we should pack ourselves on the back that we've done it. It's done using um, the, the Baron acoustic oscillations. That you've, you've probably heard about the, um, the galaxy power spectrum as a function of, of, of scale here. So small scales here, large here, has these, these small oscillations imprinted on it from a time when um, baryonic material and radiation were, were strongly coupled in the early universe and sound waves could propagate. And here's a blow up of dividing out a smooth curve. So this acoustic scale is a standard rule that you can see in the galaxy density field in a variety of redshifts. Um, so we can map out the relation between distance and redshift empirically. And small deviations in this line would allow us to say whether the, um, the, the vacuum density was evolving with time. And as far as we can tell, to uh, a precision of about 5 or 6%, it's not. That is, W is consistent with, um, with minus 1. And basically, the next 10 years in cosmology will be, will be devoted to pushing this precision down to about 1%. The, the uh, more easily depressed among us, which I guess includes me, just have an awful sinking feeling that when we've done all that, it'll still be consistent with minus one. But you know, we, we will check, and it's if, certainly if it turns out to be not minus one, that's radical. But at the moment, it looks like lambda. So the alternative line of approach is to say, well, you infer the existence of this stuff by writing down the Friedman equation, but that comes as a consequence of, of Einstein's relativistic theory of gravity. So maybe one simply needs to replace that. And so there's a huge um, amount of effort going into probing deviations from, of, of modified gravity. And the way this is done most easily, in a way that's theory independent, 
is, is to look on large scales um, and, ju and just linearize it. So if you imagine you wanted to, to look at the, at the metric of space-time, the time part and the spatial part can, be, um, can gain metric fluctuations, which in, 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 in the simple case would both be the same, both trace to the um, Newtonian gravitational potential. But in principle, that they can be different. And, and the gravitational potential satisfies Poisson's equation, and so the effective G in Poisson's equation on large scales might be different. And so there's a lot of effort basically trying to understand whether the two potentials are identical or whether G takes its standard value. The trouble is, um, we've already used the idea of modified gravity to, to think it might be responsible for the accelerated expansion of the universe without having lambda in it. So the way that we have to deal with looking at this is looking at, on smaller scales, at the development of density fluctuations. So here is a computer simulation of a, of a galaxy survey where each um, particle is placed at its true radial distance. But as it would be observed, it gains distortions. And these are because any collapsing self-gravitating structure is associated with peculiar velocities. So those peculiar velocities modify the observed redshift. And this gives us a, a nice isotropic signature, which you can see by your eye, and we can certainly see statistically, to measure the growth rate of density fluctuations. So this is effectively to get a handle on whether G, on cosmological scales, has its standard value. This hasn't come out too well. There's a whole pile of points on here, some of which are invisible. There's one there. And this is the growth rate versus redshift from the standard model with lambda in it. And basically, at the 10% level, everything is consistent. You can do similar studies with uh, that. So there are, there are two aspects. You want to look at G. You want to look at the, the ratio of the metric potentials. Gravitational light deflection, um, gravitational lensing probes that. And again, the strength of that effect is consistent at the 10% level. So you can find in literature diagrams like this where standard gravity sits in the center of a two-parameter linearized plane and there's no indication of any deviation. So it looks like we have standard gravity and we have a constant dark energy as our standard model. So how do we deal with that? And the problem is that there's another difficulty beyond the naturalness one. Um, which is not simply the level of the vacuum energy and whether we can calculate it, but this why now problem, that is the fact that um, we live pretty close to the time when, uh, when the one and only time when, when the vacuum density crosses over the matter density. And yet, you could imagine the vacuum was here or, or here, and this would be at a very different era. So, when you're faced with a question like this, which puts observers within the question, why do we live now observing the universe to have this property? You have to take into account observer selection. So you have to think in what circumstances would observers either not be here or be here with, with a lower weight? And nobody thinks that this is controversial in, in the context of a single universe. So um, as we said already, life, for example, couldn't live before matter radiation equality, so the fact that we live at a later time is no surprise. Um, but you can't make the same argument for lambda. And this is what, what's led people to the more radical approach, which is treating anthropic arguments from a many universe point of view. And we are naturally led to think this way in other areas of cosmology anyway. Many, er many models of initial conditions, inflation, naturally predict a multiverse. That is, um, you, you would have within some eternally inflating space-time, driven by a, a large value of vacuum density that never declines, regions where the vacuum energy is able to random walk its way to small enough values that inflation ceases. And this nucleates little bubbles. I say little bubbles. These, these are bubbles that are exponentially larger than, than our existing universe. But there's still many of them that are causally disconnected from each other. So our, our entire observable universe would be the size of this green dot, but much smaller, within a bubble, which is nevertheless finite. And so if it's possible 
to have different values of parameters, such as lambda or, or other ones, within those bubbles, you can suddenly ask, from a, a probabilistic point of view, what's the, um, the distribution of values that, lamb the that the observer should see? And um, you can see that this could matter. What I've got here is, is a, another plot of the power spectrum, except now it's multiplied by three powers of k to rotate the, the function over. But this is in the form of d variance by d, by d log scale. And it's shown as a function of redshift. So at, um, at redshift 4, it would be here. Today, it's here. But in the future, it doesn't increase very much, because once lambda dominates in the universe, the growth of density fluctuation <coughs> switches off. And this point of 1 is, is an interesting one. That's where nonlinear structure formation comes in. So if you, didn't, if you were below this, you would have linear fluctuations in which complex structures such as galaxies might not exist. So this is what drove um, Steven Weinberg back in the 1980s to an outrageous prediction when he was thinking about the naturalness problem for the cosmological constant. He realized that large values might suppress structure formation to the point where you wouldn't um, see anything. And he said, if the anthropic principle accounts for the smallness of the cosmological constant, we would expect a vacuum energy 10 to 100 times the matter density because there's no reason for it to be smaller. And this was a correct prediction, which um, therefore deserves, I think, quite a lot of credit. You might ask, well, how are you going to, to allow this to happen? How is lambda going to differ between different members of the multiverse? The short answer is we don't know. The string theorists would like to say they do know. Um, but you can, th these debates were had before string theory and may well continue afterwards. So for example, this very simple model was put up by Lindy Valenkin. They simply said, let's have another scalar field. You can't have too many scalar fields in cosmology. And let it have a, a potential that, that crosses V equals zero. And so the, the scalar field happily rolls down this ramp. Um, but it's placed somewhere on this ramp with quantum fluctuations. So if inflation applies, the, f the phi field gets large excursions this way. And if the potential is flat, then it just freezes. So each member of the inflationary multiverse would easily come out with a different lambda with more or less a uniform probability prior of values. Who knows if this is right, but it's, it's a worked example. And so now you can apply Bayes' theorem again and take that prior, which is a constant, times something for the observers. And to, this, is, this is where the difficulty comes in. What we have to do is to, uh, to ask how the, the, the observer weight of a different member of the multiverse would come in according to lambda. Now, we have a feeling that we know the typical mass of galaxies. I think this is a formula that Joe had something to do with. We know empirically that the Milky Way and systems like it are the ones that host most of the stars in the universe. So if you don't make Milky Ways, you might think those members of the ensemble would be downweighted. So back in the 90s, George Estathieu elaborated um, Weiberg's calculation in exactly this way and predicted the distribution of lambda weighting according to the, the abundance of Milky Ways, if you like. And 0.7 looks pretty good compared to the, um, the curves that he produced. So this is a counterexample to those who say that anthropic reasoning can't be tested. Um, if these distributions all peaked up near 1 and the observed value was down at 0.1, we wouldn't believe this mode of explanation. We've failed to disprove it. It should be pointed out, though, that most of the discussion you'll read about this focuses on the positivity of lambda, that is, why lambda couldn't be large. It could also be large and negative. Um, and there, the reason that we don't observe that is, is completely different, because a, a negative lambda universe would recollapse, and in the recollapse phase, structure formation actually is more efficient than it is with a large positive lambda. So the reason that we d cut off at, at negative values of the vacuum density has to, to do with the fact that there's not much time left over. And you can specify this as at the temperature of the universe in the recollapsing phase that you're willing to tolerate as a maximum. Once you get to a few tens of Kelvin, there's so little time left between then and the big crunch 
but no life, I think, plausibly could develop. So there's a mild preference, actually, for lambda to be negative, and I've always thought it would have been a more interesting universe to live in uh, if, than a positive one. But uh, I think we can understand it's not so surprising to have ended up with a positive value. So for a while I thought that this was all looking pretty positive, and, but now I'm, I'm slightly less sure. Let, let me explain. Here is a, a dissection of, of how we got to the observers that we, that we have. This is the so-called madao lily diagram. It's the co-moving density of star formation versus redshift. And like all good things, it goes up and then it comes down. So the universe was at its most active at about redshift 2, and star formation activity seems to be converging to the present. And you might think, well, OK, is this tied to the fact that the universe is becoming lambda-nominated? It's not so clear. At redshift 2, lambda was like 8% of the total energy density. It becomes about 50% at redshift 0.3. It's hard to imagine this turn down would have noticed lambda until it got to about here. But nevertheless, you can certainly ask, what would this look like if lambda was much larger? Would it then turn down at much higher redshifts, yielding a, a smaller total stellar content? And you can try and calculate this, and it's not possible to do it definitively yet. Um, the simplest approach is to take what's called semi-analytic galaxy formation. Sorry, I don't think you're looking nervous at the chair. I've got just a couple more slides. Um, where, where the... Um, ah, right, OK, I thought it might be worse than that. So the, uh, the ingredients of, of, of such a model... We start off with the idea that dark matter congeals into clumps, the so-called dark matter halos, and they start up small of you know, maybe hundreds or thousands of solar masses, and by progressive merging build up to the, uh, the biggest halos of, say, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 solar masses, the rich clusters of galaxies today. They contain baryonic material in the form of gas, which has to, to radiate away its energy. If it radiates away enough, then you form stars. And you also congeal some of those baryons into, into central black holes in the galaxies. Then both the stars and the black holes themselves can pump energy back out into the gas. So there's a, a complex feedback interaction that dictates the subsequent star formation rate within a single galaxy. Um, but with a bit of tuning, these models can more or less match what we see. And what we see is, is a fairly pitiful efficiency. So if you ask how well star formation has done so far, it's um, in undergraduate terms, it's a complete fail. Only 4% only of the barons in the universe, roughly, have made it into stars so far. Um, and that's an interesting number. And I, I think, as a starting point, one should take that number as the observer waiting if you're thinking about a multiverse. That is, assuming you want to not change the amount of baryonic material in the multiverse, which in principle you could, but let's start simple. Let's make many copies of our universe, all with the same baryon density, just turn lambda up and down. How does the fraction of the baryons finding their way into stars change? Because that, I think, is the anthropic weighting that we should apply. Um, and the trouble is, 4% is only where we've got to at the moment. But the universe that we're in is becoming a flat, vacuum-dominated universe. It will expand exponentially forever. So I think he stole this quote from somebody else, but it's, it's a nice quote. You know, everybody in cosmology focuses on understanding the first 13 billion years. But, you know, there's a lot of 13 billion years to come, or trillion years, or trillion, trillion years. Do we really know what the long-term fate of, of the baryonic material is in the universe. Um, in terms of dark matter, we can be pretty confident. So here is the, the, the mass function of, of dark matter halos. Um, this is in the form of the, the contribution of halos to the total dark matter density per log halo mass. So you can see it's actually pretty flat at, um, at low masses, but it cuts off exponentially at high masses. And as the universe ages and, and merges continue, this cutoff mass just marches up. 
but it stops marching as the um, as the universe becomes lambda nominated. So here's a bit of the past. This is how it was at redshift one. So you wouldn't expect at redshift one to find anything more massive than about 10 to the 14 and a half solar masses. Today, at redshift zero, that cutoff is getting on to 10 to the 16. And as you march forward, and I don't know if this has occurred to you, that the future in cosmology corresponds to negative redshift. And the infinite future is redshift minus one. So let's go to 0.9. Basically, things saturate. So you have a population of dark matter halos that is unchanging for all infinite time. Good. Um, all we need to do, therefore, is figure out what happens to the, the, um, the gas inside them. So I had a master student, Matt Kaprowski, look at this. Oh dear, this isn't very legible. How many times have you heard this? This looks good on my screen. And I actually went to a lot of trouble of thickening up the lines on this plot. You know, a lot of times, people put up plots and they look crap and that's because they didn't bother to make an effort and that's not the case. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> so um, what I asked him to do was simply to take these, um, these semi-analytic codes and run them into the future. So th 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 let's be clear, this is not computer simulation and m many people, and you'll hear from Adrian Sitz later on about how you directly simulate galaxy formation. This is doing everything simply with following the, the almost analytically the, the, um, the process of halo merging and, and what happens to the gas. So it's approximate, but at least it's fast. So what you've got plotted here is a whole pile of panels, all of which are the same generically. Up on the y-axis is you have the stellar fraction. So at the top of the panel, one represents all the baryons associated with that halo have been turned into stars. Um, and what you've got on the bottom here is reciprocal time. So t equals infinity is here. Um, uh, it's, it's reciprocal giga years, so, um, so the, the present universe is more or less here. So what I hoped was that these things might be nice and linear in terms of one over time, so you could just extrapolate to, to find the intercept at um, t equals infinity. Well, that doesn't work, and you can only go so far in the future, and Mac went to, I think, um, 200 billion years, so there's still quite a bit of time left. And what you can see, unsurprisingly, is that the, um, the stellar contents are rising. Whether you think it's plausible that they asymptote to one is not so clear, but it's, it's also clear that we're far from finished in the present universe. So I think I'd, I'd state as a minimum that it remains open as a possibility to be explored, that in the current universe, that is, even though its far future is heavily lambda-dominated, all the baryons will turn into stars. And if that's true in this universe, then a universe with a larger value of lambda, which spends more time, but still infinite time, lambda-dominated, then the, the situation may well be the same. So if that was true, then we'd have tested a particular multiverse, that is the one the first promoted by Weinberg and shown it to be false because observer selection could not account for, for the small value of lambda. What would we do then? Well, you might cling to observer selection because after all, you know, the universe in a trillion years' time is going to be a strange place. The Milky Way will still exist, but observation of cosmology will cease to be possible because the nearest galaxies will be exponentially far away. So if the majority of cosmologists are actually to be born in a trillion years' time, they probably won't think of asking questions about the universe. Not just because they've read all our great papers, but also because there'll be no stimulus for them to do so. Or you can say, well, I don't believe that. You know, this is not the explanation. But then, what is the alternative? If, if, if there's nothing else on the table that can explain why lambda is small and non-zero, we should press with this. Um, and the obvious way to go is... it's. Um, it's a bit, bit like the, the Great War, you know, you, you send the troops over the top and they all get shot to pieces and rather than saying, okay, that wasn't a good idea, you just send more troops the next day. So Weinberg had an ensemble where uh, only lambda varied, but there are plenty of other cosmological parameters. And I talked earlier on about the, um, the baryon to photon ratio, for example. We could vary that. Many, um, there's many possibilities. And we can only take an empirical approach because we don't know the correct physics. So one 
would wish to explore these and see if, even in, in the presence of regarding infinite time in the future, you get the correct conclusion, that is, that a large values of, of, of a vacuum density, although more natural, would not be observed by us. Um, but this is tough, because I've argued that you can get a prior for lambda in a plausible way. For other parameters, it's hard, and you need a more complete theory. So the conclusion, maybe, is that A, there's a lot to do to flesh this out, but also that we should think about better physically-based approaches. After all, if there is physics in the universe that allows lambda to vary, which there better had be, otherwise all this is, is moot, then it exists. It's in this room today, and we should be able to access it directly and probe it. And then you won't need astronomy to talk about any of this. Okay, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much.